William Barry was born in Starbridge, the youngest of four children of Henry and Mary Jane Barry. Tragically, he was orphaned in infancy. His father, who worked for a local fishmonger, died in a horse and cart accident in Hales Owen on April 10, 1860. William's mother, possibly suffering from postnatal depression, was committed to the Worcester County Lunatic Asylum on May 7, 1860. She remained there until her death at 33 on March 30, 1864. Elizabeth Ann, William's eldest sibling, died at the age of seven during an epileptic seizure on September 7, 1859, possibly contributing to their mother's depression. Initially raised in Dudley by his maternal uncle, Edward Henley, William was enrolled at the Blue Coat Charity School in Starbridge by 1871. At 16, William found work as a factory clerk in a warehouse at Horsley Fields. However, he left the warehouse in the early 1880s after failing to repay a loan. He then worked for a local manufacturer called Osborne on Lord Street until he was dismissed for theft in either 1884 or 1885. His whereabouts for the next few years are uncertain, but he seemed to have lived an unsettled life in the English Midlands in Yorkshire. By 1887, he was making a living as a hawker, selling small items such as pencils and key rings on the streets of Snow Hill in Birmingham. In October of 1887, Barry made his way to Bow, London, and secured a job selling sawdust for James Martin, who seemed to operate a brothel at 80 Quicket Street. Initially lodging in the stable, Barry later relocated to the house. It was there that he crossed paths with Ellen Elliott, employed by Martin as both a servant and likely a prostitute. Ellen, born on October 24, 1856, at the Bricklayer's Arms Public House in Walworth, London, was the daughter of George Eliot. In her adult years, she worked as a needlewoman and in a jute processing factory. In 1883, she bore an illegitimate daughter, also named Ellen, who passed away in December of 1885 at the Poplar Workhouse. Shortly after her daughter's death, she commenced employment with Martin. In March of 1888, Ellen and William departed Martin's service and settled into a furnished room at 3 Swatton Road, where they cohabitated until their marriage on Easter Monday, April 2, 1888. Martin later claimed he had terminated William's employment due to outstanding debts. Both Martin and the landlady at 3 Swatton Road, Elizabeth Haynes, characterized Barry as a violent alcoholic. On April 7, 1888, Haynes caught Barry kneeling over his five-day bride, threatening her with a knife. As a result, Haynes expelled them, and Ellen sold one of her 100-pound shares in a railway company inherited from her aunt, Margaret Barron, to settle William's debt to Martin. The couple relocated to 11 Blackthorn Street, near Swatton Road. According to Martin, William contracted a venereal disease. In June, Ellen liquidated the remaining shares, and by August, they had moved to 3 Spanby Road, adjacent to where William housed his horse. With the proceeds from the shares, they indulged in a week-long holiday in Wolverhampton with one of William's drinking buddies, and Ellen splurged on new jewelry. William's abuse of his wife persisted throughout the latter part of 1888. By early December, Ellen's windfall had nearly depleted prompting William to sell his horse and cart. In January of the following year, he informed his landlord at 3 Spansby Road of his contemplation to relocate to Brisbane, Australia, requesting two wooden crates for the journey. However, instead of Brisbane, William and Ellen relocated to Dundee, Scotland, with Ellen reluctantly agreeing, misled by William's false claims of securing a position in a jute factory there. The Burries embarked northward as second-class passengers aboard the steamer Cambria. They reached Dundee on the evening of January 20th, 1889, and by the following morning, they had secured lodging above a bar at 43 Union Street. However, their stay was brief, lasting only eight days before they relocated on January 29th to a squat at 113th Princess Street, a basement flat beneath a shop. William acquired the key under false pretenses, misleading the letting agents about his intentions. 
Meanwhile, Ellen secured employment as a cleaner at a local mill, but resigned after just one day. William, on the other hand, continued his heavy drinking habits, often accompanied by David Walker, who was refurbishing the public house frequented by William. On February 4th, William purchased rope from a local grocer shop and spent the remainder of the day observing court cases from the public gallery. He was noted for his attentive demeanor during the proceedings. This pattern repeated on February 7th with William attending court sessions once more. On February 10th, he visited Walker, who lent him a newspaper featuring a woman's suicide by hanging. That evening, he walked into Dundee Central Police Station on Bell Street and reported his wife's suicide to Lieutenant James Parr. According to William, they had consumed alcohol heavily the night before her death, and he awoke to find her body on the floor with a rope around her neck. Instead of summoning medical assistance, he confessed to cutting the body and concealing it in one of the packing cases brought from London. William expressed fears of being arrested and accused of being Jack the Ripper. Parr brought William to see Lieutenant David Lamb, head of the detective department, stating, This man has quite a tale for you. William recounted his story to Lamb, omitting the mention of Jack the Ripper and claiming to have stabbed his wife's body once. A search of William yielded a small knife, bank book, and his house key, which were confiscated pending further investigation. Lamb and Detective Constable Peter Campbell proceeded to the Burry's dismal flat, where they uncovered Ellen's mutilated remains concealed within the wooden box commissioned by William in London. Lamb returned to the police station and formally charged William with Ellen's murder. Ellen's jewelry, discovered in William's possession, was seized as evidence. A more thorough search conducted the following morning revealed bloodstained clothing within the crate that once contained Ellen's body, as well as remnants of clothing and some of Ellen's personal belongings burnt in the fireplace. The absence of furniture in the flat suggested that it might have been used to fuel the fire, either for warmth or to obliterate evidence. A sizable penknife bearing traces of human flesh and blood was also recovered, along with the rope William had purchased on the morning of February 4th featuring strands of Ellen's hair entwined within its fibers. Ellen's body underwent examination by five physicians, including Police Sergeant Charles Templeman, his colleague Alexander Stalker, Edinburgh surgeon Henry Littlejohn, and two local doctors, David Lennox and William Kinnear. Their collective assessment concluded that Ellen had been strangled from behind. Additionally, her right leg had been broken in two places to facilitate its insertion into the crate. Incisions, likely made by a penknife, were observed running downwards along her abdomen, with Templeman, Stalker, and Little John estimating that these wounds had been inflicted within at most 10 minutes of the time of death. On March 18, 1886, Barry was formally charged with the murder of his wife, to which he pleaded not guilty. The trial commenced before Lord Young in the High Court of Justiciary on March 28. Barry's defense team, consisting of solicitor David Tweedy and advocate William Hay, faced off against the prosecution led by advocate Dill McKinney. The proceedings spanned 13 hours, with prosecution witnesses including Ellen's sister, Margaret Corney, William's former employer, James Martin, their London landlady, Elizabeth Haynes, William's drinking companion, David Walker, Lieutenant Lamb, and doctors Templeman and Little John. Following a break for supper, Hay presented the defense case, heavily relying on Dr. Lennox's testimony suggesting Ellen had strangled herself. At 10.05 p.m., Lord Young concluded his summation, and the jury of 15 men retired to deliberate. After 25 minutes, they returned with a verdict of guilty, with a recommendation for mercy. Lord Young inquired about the reason for the recommendation, to which a juror cited the contradictory medical evidence, particularly Lennox's testimony. Lord Young instructed the jury to reconsider their verdict until they were unanimous. At 10.40 p.m., they returned with a unanimous guilty verdict, leading Lord Young to impose the mandatory sentence for murder, death by hanging. On April 1st, Barry solicitor David Tweedy petitioned the Secretary of State for Scotland, Lord Lothian, for clemency, arguing for commutation to life imprisonment 
due to the conflicting medical evidence and the jury's initial hesitations. Tweedy also raised the possibility of inherited insanity from Burry's mother, who had died in a lunatic asylum. However, the Secretary of State declined to intervene, and Barry was executed on April 24th by hangman James Barry. Thank you all so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up and hit the subscribe button to join our community. We upload every Monday and Thursday at 4pm. For more content like this, be sure to check out our other videos on the channel. You can also follow us on our other social media platforms for uploads and updates. Thanks again for watching, and we'll see you in the next video.